Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for attending this webcast on using art and design in science produced by Nature Careers. My name is Jet Leeming. I'm one of the editors here at Nature. And in just a moment, I'm going to pass over to Kelly Krauss, uh, who is our creative director here at Nature. Um, she's going to be talking about how to grab individual scientists' attention um, using art and design. After Kelly, we'll hear from Sven Lacqua, who runs Lacqua Consulting. He's going to be talking about jet data visualization in science and um, uh, some sort of general design principles when, pre when presenting scientific data. Uh, finally, we'll hear from Fabio Cremeri, who is a freelance researcher and designer. Um, he's going to be talking about color usage and accessibility in science. After those three excellent talks, um, we'll go straight into a question and answer session, um, which uh, will be in about half an hour. Uh, if you do have a question at any point uh, during these three talks, please do feel free to click on the Ask a Question button, and we'll get to answering as many as possible um, before the, the session ends in about an hour's time. So thank you so much for attending. I really hope you enjoy the webcast, and uh, we'll look forward to hearing your questions soon. Hello, welcome. I'm Kelly Krauss, Creative Director for Nature and Nature Journals. And today I'm going to be taking you through getting noticed, how to promote your research with visuals. Uh, we will be discussing a few different kinds of visuals. One of them, one group is photography and moving image. Uh, we'll also go into summary figures, cover artwork, or sort of more conceptual artwork, and bringing it all together with social media in five easy steps. Uh, step one is photography and video. Um, my advice for you here is to make images, make lots of images all the time, <laughs> um, and all kinds sort of moving images, still images, uh, because photography is particularly powerful. It sort of effortlessly communicates. Um, and not just any photography, but really high quality photography. So you'll want your images to be high resolution, um, and that goes all the way through from your microscopy to you know, using a regular old camera or a video camera. Um, also, high quality images is not just how it looks, but what, what it is. So, you know, in science, it's all about the process of discovery. So we're particularly interested in sort of original images, novel images, things that haven't been seen before or maybe haven't been seen in a particular way. Um, and those are really popular when sharing. Um, also a note about video footage. Um, seeing how something works, how something moves is incredibly enlightening. It in increases comprehension. So if there's anything that you work with that moves, be it machinery, a living thing or whatever, um, capture it in video, even if it's just a handful of seconds um, for sharing, because that is incredibly valuable and popular. And think about image making throughout your work um, and build it into your experimental setup um, and have a bunch of images that you can then prune along the way. Step two is a little bit different, <laughs> uh, or maybe a lot different. Uh, but so this is summary figures, or sometimes called graphical abstract. What this is is telling the story of your research in a single image that's more of a diagram and a sort of pictorial style. Um, it's, again, delivering the main message of your research in a very succinct, accessible way. It is not telling the whole story. It is not um, every little bit of your research. It's just the main message. Um, also, as an example, sort of what is and is not a summary figure, uh, this is a um, paper that was recently published in Nature on atomic clocks that I'll, I'll use in its example going through the presentation. Um, and uh, this is a data figure from the paper. Um, and this is not a summary figure. So a summary figure, it's not necessarily you know, taking data from your paper or different panels from your paper. Uh, a summary figure is really actually a sort of a diagram explaining it in a very simple um, sort of pair it back way. Um, so what you can see here is, is you can kind of get a sense, unlike from the data figure, you can get a sense just by looking at it that it is involving somehow involving time and clocks. Um, and what you're seeing here, um, basically sort of clouds of atoms in a pancake-like optical lattice here in the sort of pink bit. Um, and uh, but you can see, you know, we have sort of clock symbols, and um, you know, so it gives you more of a sense. It's easier to sort of enter into this and try and understand what this is about. Uh, some very top level pointers. I won't have time to go into a, a lot of detail here, but use a pictorial style again, something that is very uh, a very simple visual language. 
start with a sketch. Um, a pencil sketch tends to be a really good way to start. There's something about working with pencil and eraser that kind of helps you find the edges of the things that you know and you don't know. Um, once you get to a good place with that sketch, then move into um, digital drawing software. Um, if the idea of going into digital drawing software keeps you up at night, <laughs> there are um, other alternatives um, to professional drawing software, um, things like BioRender, which are um, programs that are, are set up, uh, sort of it's basically set up where it has pre-drawn icons and things that you can kind of drag and drop into a scene. Um, I'll have a resource page at the end of the talk, and, uh, and there'll be a link to BioRender in there, and also a link to they have a, a video with really good tips about practical abstracts. Um, the main thing that you should do is simplify. Simplify, pair back, simplify again. Uh, don't overload the figure because that will sort of defeat the purpose of your summary figure. <laughs> um, so you want to make it really, really simple and clear. Um, and then also the labeling. Pay attention to that. Um, make the labels work for you um, with really good, clear, and concise settings and not too long. Um, and then don't consider it finished until you receive feedback from others, it can sometimes be very enlightening to receive this feedback and uh, things that you thought were simple are actually uh, not that straightforward. Um, so friends and family tend to be really good test subjects, I always recommend. Moving on to something a bit different, um, is sort of cover art, I call it cover artwork, but it's really just kind of conceptual artwork. Um, and uh, it tends to end up on journal covers, which just tends to be um, its main purpose, but it can also be used in other ways um, to, to gain attention and tends to be very beautiful and striking. Uh, I'm using this example you're looking at because this is the cover for the paper that I just discussed. So, um, you know, it's as you can see, uh, that bit that was in the, um, the summary figure that was that kind of pink uh, pancake the lettuce, you know, that is actually shown here a bit on the cover, um, you know, with the same laser going through. But what we've done here is we're, we're now using kind of visual metaphors a bit more heavily here where, you know, the sort of clouds of atoms actually look like clocks, like a clock you have on the wall. To kind of give you, you know, it, it takes a bit more artistic license. It's still, um, you know, it's a good, nice combination of science and art, which brings me to my next slide, which really, you know, a good kind of conceptual piece of art needs to be, you know, in, in the context of science, it needs to be two different things. It needs to have a good, clear concept grounded in the science, and then also needs to be well executed. So the art, you know, art side of it, it has to look good. Um, in terms of concepting, you know, I always say covers are a bit like film posters. They should hint at it, um, you know, what the research is about, but it does not have to tell the whole story. So don't overburden it. Um, it can be beautiful <laughs> and just hint at things. Um, it is true that some things are easier to visualize than others. Sort of nouns, things like cells, planets, qubits, viruses are easier to, to kind of show um, then phenomenon processes like verbs, basically, um, for example, quantum is So I have an example here, you know, this is a virus, not to say the execution of this was easy, but the concept is more or less straightforward. We're showing an object, a virus. Um, whereas here, you know, it was a paper on quantum cryptography. So what does code breaking look like in the quantum space? You know, we had to sort of bring in, some, you know, like a metaphor, you know, a lock and some glowing lights and things. Um, so just you know, be uh, be mindful of, of having to use an, an appropriately appropriate use of visual metaphors, um, such as in the, the clocks. Uh, and you know, some artwork tips. You know, very quickly in top level needs to be high resolution, really great, clean, dynamic composition. You know, pick a point of focus um, and don't overdress it. You know, keep it simple and use good um, colors, good contrast, and avoid red and green combinations um, that are problematic for color blindness. Uh, step four are the words. So. Um, now that you have all of your amazing visual assets, you know, you have your photography, your video, your, your summary figure, you have, you know, your great conceptual artwork. These things need to have some text descriptions uh, to tempt and to draw people in and to kind of help people understand what these things are. Um, do make your uh, descriptions um, 50 to 60 words max. So, you know, make them short. Uh, but, you know, that doesn't mean that they're not informative. So you can, in that space, cover the basics, the who, the what, the why, the when, whatever is relevant. Um, as you can see in this image on the left, that's 56 words, so it can be done. <laughs> and, and, and tempt people, you know, don't tell people everything, tempt people uh, when you're sharing things and then link back to, to where there's more information. Um, use appropriate tagging and credits. Uh, now we move on to our final step, step five, which is putting this all together 
and using social media as you know the power of networks to to get out your the great work you've been doing um, using your amazing images and your really tempting text and um, you know now that you have a variety of different kinds of images you can do multiple posts about more or less the same thing but um, but you know it, it adds a lot of variety and, and posts with visuals always do better than posts without. Um, also another final tip really is you know people enjoy sort of making up kind of backstory type content so save your draft sketches and outtakes and describe your process as we did here in this um, Instagram slideshow um, looking at the uh, the making of a recent Nature's Ten cover, or you know, it could be the slideshow, or it can just be a single image with you know, sort of um, sketches and things. Um, so people are very interested in process. Um, the last thing I'll say is make sure you have permission to use the visuals you're sharing, and remember to credit any sources that are relevant. Um, and you know, all of these wonderful images uh, that you've created, all these visual assets, go way beyond social media. You can use them on your research website, for grant applications, posters, press releases. So just you know, it's worth all of the hard work. And uh, thank you very much for joining us. Here is the resource page. I'll pause here for a moment where you can screenshot it. And uh, thank you very much. Take care. Goodbye. Hi, I'm Sven, and I want to talk a bit about visual design in science. In particular, I want to focus on design principles and how to use them to visualize scientific data kind of effectively. And a little bit about myself first. My background is very much at the intersection between design, science, and business. Um, I have a PhD in human-computer interaction. Um, for a couple of years, I was a teaching fellow in interaction design. Um, I then went on to work at digital science, where I was leading the user experience um, for 10 years, um, working on existing products, creating new products. And I more recently moved on to set up my own consultancy. Um, to find ways to bring together experience design, research, and strategy. And then I have a bit of extra time. I do mentoring on the side um, for new ventures on product and UX. Um, the way I look at design and science is very much as not distinct disciplines, but I very much see uh, a strong commonality between the two. Um, they're both Gear to solving problems, and they are doing that um, through a very uh, structured methodological approach, um, through the creation of hypotheses and tests, um, failing and learning from failure, and iterating until um, the problem has been solved, uh, whether that's a scientific problem or a design problem. And so, why I'm saying this? I'm saying this to let tell you that if you have this scientific mindset, I think you're already pretty well equipped to also solving design problems uh, with, with the same, same rigor in, in, in thinking. And a good place to start is to learn a bit more about Gestalt laws or Gestalt principles. Uh, those have been formulated over 100 years ago, um, and they describe really how our brain perceives information, how it interprets the world, how it tries to find similarities, proximities um, to make sense of the world. And to illustrate this, um, I wanted to show you this example. Um, these are dots of random shape moving in a certain pattern. But because of what your brain has experienced, it's probably aware of a dog. Um, it interprets this as a moving dog. If you've never seen a dog, you may just see dots moving on the screen. Um, and so this is really critical to understand when, when you have data and you visualize it, that there's this intent of how you're displaying it, but there is someone looking at it and interpreting it in certain ways. And what you want to make sure is um, that those are aligned as much as possible. So learning more about perception and so guiding um, how people see what, what you're designing for is, is really critical. Um, a good, very practical guide to, to, to start learning more about this is this book on universal principles of design. It's listing 100 plus examples of, of theory on one side of uh, human perception, cognition, and um, how we can use it effectively with examples on the other side to to 
design things well. One of my favorite uh, principles is the signal to noise ratio. Uh, most scientists will be familiar with collecting lots of data. Um, there's always noise in the data. What you're trying to do is you're cleaning up the data to really hone in on the, the key information, the signal. And very much the same thing you do when you're uh, visually designing information. So I chose this example of, of tabular data because pretty much every paper uh, has a data table in it. And there's a big difference when you're removing the noise and honing in on the signal as to how easy it is for the audience to, to, to um, perceive um, um, what's important. Another great example is proximity. So things grouped together or in, in close proximity to each other are usually perceived as, as a group. Um, and so there's a nice story um, from the 1850s um, of a Dr. John Snow during the cholera pandemic in London. Um, he decided to map cases of cholera onto the, the street map. And the clusters that emerged made them realize that there was a single well uh, that was spreading the disease. And so sealing off that well made the disease um, go away. And so these days, we have a, a lot of frameworks and libraries that we can use readily online um, to throw data at and create exciting visualizations. Um, D3 is, is a very popular one. There's lots of other ones out there. Um, but what is important is to initially take a step back and look at the data and think about the data you have and make sure that you chose the, the most appropriate and, uh, way to visualize for it. So we have categorical data, we have numerical data. Some of it is continuous, some of it is discrete. And so, um, it is important to, to be aware of the, what the data is and then choosing appropriate way. And, ways and means of, of visualizing it. Uh, taking a step back and walking you through some really basic examples, pie charts are very infamous. Um, often they're treated as they have no use whatsoever. Um, there is a, a narrow band to, to, to making use of them if you have data that adds up to a whole and it is very uh, few categories in it, then um, the pie chart might be quite effective actually at showing proportions. So are the two data points kind of equal in, in size or is one much larger than the other? The pie chart might work very well for that, but it doesn't work very well for, very well for, for much beyond that. So as soon as you're starting to have more data points, you'll find that comparing this in the pie chart is just not practicable because our brain isn't geared up to very well interpret angles. Um, so we will have a hard time judging if Friday or Tuesday in this case is the larger one. This is where bar charts come in. They're much more appropriate for this kind of data visualization. And bar charts generally are used very heavily in, in, in scientific papers or, or scientific work in general. Um, uh, another common mistake of bar charts is that we, we often might find that we have very similar data points to compare. So if we would display it from a, like a zero axis, uh, it might be hard to judge them. So an um, appealing thing, but quite easily a, uh, a mistake to make would be to create a non-zero axis and then show a bar chart like this. The problem here is that our brains interpret not the absolute position against the axis, but the size of the bar. And because the Thursday looks more than double the size of the Wednesday, we will end up misinterpreting this data. A way to solve for that is to not use a bar chart, but a dot chart, in which case um, we are basically forced to interpret the relative position of the dots rather than the size of the bar. Um, there's also great examples online on how to visualize categorical data um, and often relationships between that. I've put in the link there. I don't have time to get over this now. Um, there are some great books to get started learning more about how to visualize data effectively and when to use what types of visualization. I'll just leave you with these books for now. 
And before finishing, there's one last thing I wanted to talk about. Um, and that is that I, I strongly believe that beyond just using design to visualizing your scientific data, there's increasingly a need to communicate our science in a more accessible, easier to digest, and importantly, harder to misunderstand way. Um, so it's, it's a lot more than just about the data. It is also about how we've arrived at the findings that we have and, and what they really mean in the bigger picture. So, um, there's two suggestions that I would want to leave you with. One is that in, in addition to visualizing the data itself, we can also visualize the scientific process that we engaged in to, to arrive at those findings. So this is an example from a paper I, I co-wrote. Um, and we were trying to include some nice kind of accessible visualizations documenting what it actually was that we did in a very easy to digest manner. Um, so the, the phases, the overall phases of the project and the actual steps in, in the research process to, to just simplify the, the process of, of interpreting the, the work. And then probably more importantly than just documenting the process visually as well is to visualizing the, the context and the meaning of our scientific work, which is something that especially with, with, with the COVID pandemic, I think we, we've increasingly been um, exposed to. And that is that there's the, the actual bits of research that we've been doing but then how they fit into the larger picture is something that is increasingly important to communicate well, um, to, to fight misinformation and make it, make it more easy for, for people to, to really, um, understand well, um, what the work that we've been doing means. Um, and that really is, is everything I, I wanted to leave you with. So thank you for listening. Hi, my name is Fabio Kramri, and I will show you a few slides about the scientific use of color and specifically um, the scientific color maps because color mapping is a fundamental method used in sciences, um, basically on a daily basis. So it's important to get it right. Um, you find all resources and more details about this on my webpage, fabiokramri.ch. And if you're interested, um, we recently also wrote um, a perspective piece in nature communications that is easy, understandable, and should contain most of the important information. So I wrote this with my co-authors, Grace Shepard and Phil Helen. So if we talk about the use of color in science, it's, it's critical to differentiate between color used for decoration and color used as an information carrier. So this differentiation is, is, is really crucial here. Um, the fact that um, most scientists have never received education in graphic design is also critical to keep in mind. Because every time I talk to scientists about this topic, um, they often raise their opinion rather than basing their, um, their um, decision making on facts. And here I really present you uh, quantities and facts and I hope I can make this clear. So understanding color mapping is important um, to understand why uh, we have to do certain things. So when we visualize, for example, a 3D graph, we usually do that with three position axes, um, an X, a Y, and a Z axis. But this is very complicated and doesn't really fit to the 2D canvases that we normally use, like a paper or a screen. If you use a color map or a color bar that contains a color map, um, we can reduce this, the complexity of this graph by just um, replacing the third position axis by a color axis. And then we still have two position axes, but only um, um, it's only in 2D and we can display it for example, on the screen much more accurately. So that's a huge advantage. And um, it's important to understand that the color bar is an axis. So it has to fulfill the same properties as the position axis bar. One of these properties is, is of course, the equal spacing between um, equally spaced ticks, axis ticks. 
a bad example would be an axis like this. That's a position axis that is um, squeezed locally um, and, and therefore um, causes some data distortion just by having a, a faulty axis. I guess it would be really hard to get something like this published in science, but then it turns out this is actually done on a daily basis because it's, this is the exact representation of the of the rainbow color map. That's the most commonly used color map in the sciences. So if you have a color bar, then this also needs to fulfill certain aspects. Um, it should show the same difference in color um, for the same change in data. So one to two, four to five, seven to eight, they should look the same, but they don't. So for example, the blue colors look much more closer to themselves than the orange to red one. Moreover, if we pick colors from this axis and uh, put it on a map or somewhere, and then it gets really hard to reorder them to know which values are higher and which values are lower. So they, this is an unordered color map. So it's unclear uh, how, how the relation between these values are. So scales really instead need to be accurate and they need to be perceptionally uniform. They need to be equally spaced like this one here or like this scientific color map here where all the differences in color uh, look the same no matter where you are on the color axis. And they are perceptually ordered. So simply by, if you go by lightness from the most light one to the darker ones, you can easily order the values again. Um, this data distortion by faulty color maps only becomes obvious if we know how the data looks like in advance, but we often in science, of course, don't. But a good exercise is to just take uh, some well-known pictures like Marie Curie here or the Earth or an apple, um, which is basically also data and, and represent them with the colored versions. So here's the faulty color map jet that hugely distorts um, the pictures. Um, for example, if we would zoom in on the white in the apple, uh, it would be really hard to, to realize it's an apple um, if you don't know in advance what it is. Whereas if you have a scientific color map like Petlo, um, the true picture is represented and there's no visual distortion. To understand how to create such a, a scientific color map, you need to understand how our visual apparatus, not just the eye, but the whole um, optical um, brain of us works and also the surrounding of the object that we look at. So this starts with the light source. This can be bright light, dark light, blue light, reddish light. And then of course the object, um, its background is really important. And then the light that is reflected from the object, not the light that is um, captured by the object is what we perceive as color. Um, it goes through the eye lens, hits the cone cells at the back of the eyes, and then is transmitted um, through the optical nerve to the optical cortex. And we perceive the apple as orange in this case. So this is very complicated. And of course, a lot of research has gone into it. Um, luckily, um, there came so far that they could, could produce a perceptionally uniform color space. And one example is the CCAM 2 UCS. And from this, one can derive a color difference metric, delta E. So that's, that gives us the difference between two different colors. It's a quantifiable um, index. And I can use this here to um, plot the change in color between neighboring colors all along these two different color maps. So Betlow on the left-hand side has an equal change in color between neighboring colors. Whereas Jet, the rainbow color map, has a, a huge difference all along the color map. So in, in some parts, you see more difference, and in other parts, you see less difference between colors. This can be further co um, quantified by just extracting the actual error that they introduce. Um, this is basically negligible for, for a scientific color map, but can be up to eight or even higher 
0.5% um, of the data range shown by the color map. So that's a huge error and likely is the most or the biggest error in your data processing. Um, to further clarify this, um, if we imagine a flat slope and represent it by either of these color maps, then for Betlo, the flat slope is still flat, but it looks extremely bubbly um, when represented with the jet column. So please do use scientific color maps, therefore, to see your data and not some visual artifacts and you know distort everything. And this is one important aspect. So you distort your data, but another one is to include all the, your readers. And of course, as uh, I hope all of you know, is that uh, many people have color vision deficiencies. So we don't all see the same. For example, um, a common one is deuteranopia, which is green blindness. And they would see these pictures like this. And another one is protanopia, red blind. And even another one is tritanopia blue blind. And in all cases, the rainbow color map fails to represent the data to them as well. And then, of course, there is also total color blindness. Or if you go and print a paper in black and white, you lose all the information and even obscure the data by just doing that. Whereas if you look at the scientific color map, it's still um, flawlessly represented. So it's a, an inclusive way to show your data. So to summarize the BETLO, the scientific color map is perceptionally uniform, rainbow is not. Um, BETLO is perceptionally ordered, rainbow is not. BETLO is color vision deficiency friendly and rainbow is not. BETLO is even readable in black and white, rainbow is not. So therefore, um, BETLO is scientific and rainbow is not. Um, and this is important because we really want, or at least I want to communicate my data without distortion as intuitively as possible. And of course, to all of my readers and not just the subset of them. So for this, I, I created the uh, entire suite of scientific color maps. They're all perceptionally uniform, even don't distort the data. They're perceptually ordered. They're intuitively readable, they're color vision deficiency friendly and therefore inclusive, and they are also readable as black and white prints. Um, furthermore, there are a complete suite of color map types and classes, so you have all the necessary color maps um, that you might use with your specific data sets. Um, they are versioned and citable, just to acknowledge the work that goes into it, and also to extend them and improve on them. Uh, they are all freely available as well on my web page. And this is the entire suite of them. And as you can see, there's lots of choices. Um, you can choose between different colors, you can choose between different types and so on. So please use scientific color maps to just represent your data fairly, intuitively and to all your readers. Um, you can easily test your figures before you use them by converting them to black and white and see whether your main message and the data is still conveyed in the way you really want to. If you do peer review, if you listen to talks and people do misuse color, please speak up and just to educate them. And it's also important to teach your students because this knowledge often gets lost and has been in the past. And then you as, a sci as scientists, please use and share only science grade graphics. And a good resource for that is the sync.org. That's an online graphics collection um, that is reviewed and, and by the entire community actually. So you can trust these graphics as well. Um, all resources related to this presentation and the scientific color maps in general, you find on my web page as well. Thank you for listening. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for sitting through those pre-recorded talks from all of our speakers. I'm pleased to say all of our speakers are here 
um, with us now for the next half an hour or so. Um, if you have a question, do please feel free to ask it by clicking on the ask a question button that should be somewhere around this video player. Um, I'm going to answer a question a few of you asked uh, whilst that was playing through, which is, of course, these slides will be made available to you and all of the talks you'll be able to see again. Um, once this webcast is finished, we'll, we'll email you a link to um, to uh, a recorded version of this talk so you can see all of those links, um, all of those books and other recommendations that my uh, that our speakers have made for you. So um, thanks very much for attending. All right, I'm going to dive into your questions. Um, you've got a lot. Thank you so much for leaving them. We'll try to get to as many um, as we can. I'm going to start with you, Kelly, if that's all right. Hi, Kelly. How are you? Hello. So very good. well, thank um, you. Hi. Um, I've got a question here from uh, someone asking uh, for your advice around summary figures. So um, Victoria, I hope you don't mind me using, me using your name, Victoria, asks um, around summary figures. I agree that simplifying is very important, but what do you think about stylizing? For example, going with a watercolor style illustration or that kind of thing, or is that best left specifically to cover artworks? So in terms of summary figures, is it best to focus on um, style or just to entirely concentrate on summarizing the signs? Yes, that's a great question. Um, thank you. So um, I would say for a summary figure, it has a specific kind of visual language, um, which is a really simple paired back pictorial style, like, like some of the things that I have shown. Um, and, and what that does is when you use a very simple language, it helps focus more on the message um, than it, uh, as a piece of artwork or as a, you know, a piece of visual design. So I would say <clears throat> exactly as you suspected uh, that to, to that it is most welcome to have artistic sort of expression in different types of media, but I would leave that to the more conceptual pieces. Great, thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I can't see Sven and Fabio on my screen, so I'm just going to make sure. Are you guys still there, Sven and Fabio? Yeah, still there. Yeah. Hi, hello. Um, thanks very much. I'm not sure why I can't see you, but let's um, let's plow on through. So, um, Sven, can I ask you just here's a simple question from someone: um, any particular advice on presenting data tables specifically? Um, any kind of tips and tricks for presenting that type of information? Um, well, it's a, it's a broad question, right? <laughs> There's a lot of different data tables out there. Um, I, I think like with, with everything, I would start with thinking about who you're displaying the data table for, what you're trying to communicate with it, right? And probably, I, like I hinted at it in, in, in the talk, right? I'm, I'm a fan of um, making the tables themselves as kind of minimalistic as possible to, to let the numbers shine. But then beyond that, it's probably the next one would be thinking about what to include and what to exclude from the table. Like what are the key numbers, right? Do you have to show all of it or is there parts of it um, that are most important? And maybe that's enough to show, right? And then beyond that, actually, probably the question is, is the data table the best thing to use, right? There may be other ways to show the numbers and the data in it, but not the table. Um, I mean, there's a lot more detail in it, but I, I think that's kind of how I would start approaching it. Thank you. Um, yeah, think about other ways maybe to present the table, is what you mean. Think about other ways to present that, that uh, numerical information rather than a table, yeah. as well as the other things you recommend. If, if you can, right? I mean, if if, I don't know if where you're publishing it, it requires all the data, right? With all this, that details, etc. You probably won't have that choice, right? But um, yeah. Gotcha. Thank you very much, um, Fabio. We, we've got loads of questions in around your um, scientific color, color map. I'm going to try to sort of bundle a few together and just ask you um, if you had any tips for um, using the Batlo color mapping tool uh, and applying it to other pieces of software. So how do you um, how do you take that kind of color mapping? Uh, yeah, like I say, tool, and then use that to build graphics practically. Um, do you, does it have to be done manually? Or is there some sort of plugin or other thing we can use? Uh, can you tell us a bit more about it? So the way I intended it um, was to just provide the color maps themselves. And then, of course, every software has some built-in uh, default color maps, which are unfortunately not always the good ones. Hmm. But um, some software tools now build in the scientific color maps as well as their default. And um, for most open access software tools, um, I provide specific formats so they can be easily just imported into the software. 
And for this, um, you find within the package, the scientific color map package, you find an instruction for all the different software, um, common software packages that people use, and then easy instructions, um, basically, where you can just follow them and do that. So it should be straightforward. And else, uh, just let me know and I will see what I can do. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, we've got loads and loads of questions coming in. So thank you, everyone, um, for asking them. And bear with me as I select one. Um, someone's asked an interesting one here. Um, Kelly, if you don't mind, I'm going to go back to you. Um, someone's asked, if, I'm not a very visual person. Uh, have you got any advice for improving artistic instincts? Um, if you're you know, a scientist, you might necessarily not have any visual training. How can you improve that? Uh, another great question. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think it's, you know, people tend to think that, um, you know, either you're sort of gifted artistically or you're not. And that's actually not true. I think, uh, you know, and, and as this question, I think sort of gets to, it's really more about developing your visual skills, which anyone can do. And I think a good analogy is, you know, if you want to become a better writer, you read really great writing, right? <laughs> um, and I think the same thing is true for visuals. I think, you know, if you want to, to develop and flex that muscle, you know, um, you know, surround yourself with really good design art, um, you know, and, and sort of read about it, practice it yourself. You know, people tend to think, oh, I'm not very good at drawing as if it's something that can just, you know, um, you're just born with. And that that's not really true. It takes practice like anything else. So, um, so it's, everyone is capable of um, becoming an artistic person. <laughs> and uh, so, so I would just say, you know, um, look out for um you know really high quality art and design um be it you know galleries be it uh you know publications um websites there's a lot now um you know blogs and things and just immerse yourself in that and um, and just get out there and practice it and don't expect to be perfect thank you i think it's, i think it's a great answer i wonder um yeah. sven and fabio if you have anything else to to add to that just in terms of becoming more visually literate and sort of growing in that way well, I would say just, yeah, expose yourself to, to things, right? Like I, I usually find just going out, looking at things, I don't know, go to a gallery, look at things, a museum, anything, right? That's inspiring. I, I For me, usually that works, right? And then obviously, yeah, I think the book analogies is, is great, right? Just, yeah, the more you expose yourself to, to what you're kind of trying to improve and strive for, I think the better and it will come. And like the, the book I was referring to, I personally, like I, I've worked with, a large cross-section of people, right? So if I work with developers, for example, I will also tell them, this is a great place to start, right? Understand design a bit better, right? Um, so going to the basics, right, I guess. Um, makes Thank sense. you. Jack, Jack, may I also just say, I think another really great place to look for great books about art and design are in um, gallery bookshops, like mm. art and design, like sort of museum bookshops. Um, you know, and gift shops tend to have really great collections of these things. Um, so that's a good place to look. Yeah, those big, beautiful, expensive coffee table <laughs> books where I always walk past. <laughs> I never once. Um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Fabio, I've got a, a question here that's um, quite specific, but I thought was interesting. Um, would you encourage sort of medical imaging communities or, or people using, um, you know, involved in that kind of scientific world to use the Batlow color charts? Would you kind of suggest that happens everywhere or is there are there limits to using that line um this person has mentioned mrpet which is always shown with a rainbow color scheme i just wonder if you had any thoughts on that right um yeah in general well petlow is just one color map of the scientific suite of color maps and there are other ones and you know there are there are other people um created some scientific color maps maps like viridis and stevidis which are well known and often build into uh, software packages as well. So you're not stuck to just one set of colors like this. You, you still have a, a big choice, but then uh, actually no matter what you do with it, if you if you present data, you want to, the access, which um, the color map is part of, uh, to be accurate. And for this, you have to have a exceptionally uniform color map. And then, of course, you also want to present the data to all people, which um, raises the need for a uh, color vision deficiency friendliness of the colors use. Gotcha. And uh, and Batlow's one um one choice of map, but it isn't the only one. You can of course use others, but exactly, have yeah. the same effect. 
And then, of course, there are different color map types as well. So Bedlow is a, is a, a continuous one, which starts with a, a darker color going to a brighter color. But then you sometimes have data like and uh, temperature anomaly, where you have a central point, zero degrees, and then you have positive and negative values. And then you often use a different um, color map uh, type for this. So yeah, there's also a user guide in the scientific color map package that kind of guides you through um, the choices you have to make depending on what data you want to visualize. Thanks very much. Great. Um, I, we've got loads of questions here um, around sort of uh, tools and things like that. So I'm, I might ask you all to maybe share a free design tool or app you particularly recommend. Um, thank you to Marie and John and many others who are asking around specific free alternatives to Photoshop or other other um, tools that you might be able to use in design. Uh, Kelly, can I put you in the spot and ask you to go first? Uh, sure thing. Yeah. So we receive a good number of um, sort of submissions for you know our papers from um, things like um, GIMP is a, a typical Photoshop replacement that's free, um, and then Inkscape is more of a sort of vector-based artwork um, replacement for let's say Adobe Illustrator. Um, and those have been around for a really long time. Um, and then also there's, I thought I'd mentioned Blender, which is a um, free 3D software. Um, so I think those three are um, pretty much industry standard sort of free alternatives, yeah. Thank you. Yep. Um, you've, you've, you've done three there and you've stolen something from Sven, but uh, Sven, oh, I, no, I, I'm, I'm so sure. Sorry. No, 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 I'm sure, I'm sure you've got um, some other suggestions. I'm not sure what, what you stole, but um, the, the one I was thinking of uh, is, is Figma, maybe. So um, it's it's a lot for designing software, and, and, and actually, it's, it's great for collaborating. Um, but I think there is, a, is a free, there is a free tier where you have like three projects that you can use. And within user experience, it's generally uh, like it's the tool everybody wants to use, but it's just great for, for anything vector related. Um, you can you can do animations, prototyping in it. Um, so it, I think it's potentially very widely usable. It, it'd be great to collaborate, which is the thing researchers have to do increasingly remotely as well, right? So it may be handy for that. Um, yeah, that's the one I was I was thinking of. Thank you very much. Um, and Fabio, I need last kind of specific tools you'd point our audience to. Um, maybe just for maps in general, like uh, GMT, generic mapping tools, which is just for data visualization, but uh, it's a very convenient way to yeah show maps and and data on maps as well. Thank you. Um, um, our our audience are adding comments. Um, suggesting Critter is another um free piece of art software that might be useful uh jason has suggested behance a great place to look for design inspiration so thank you so much um for your comments um i uh we've had a few other questions in around hand drawing um so using kind of hand drawn illustrations to um uh, in papers and also uh, transferring those hand drawn illustrations onto the computer um kelly if you don't mind uh, me going back to you um have you got any sort of general thoughts around hand-drawn illustrations? Are they helpful or um, would you prefer something made digitally? And um, any tips for moving those onto, uh, you know, move, moving those into the digital world? Yeah, so I would say hand-drawn illustrations have the downside of if, you know, if you're working with, um, let's say, a, a, in terms of publishing. Um, it is difficult for, you know, to sort of edit those, right? So I think that's the reason why, you know, it's um, better to, if you're working in the context of publishing, to avoid hand-drawn for figures. Um, not to say, you know, that's completely different from, let's say, conceptual illustration and cover artwork, which would, that would be perfectly um, acceptable and, and encouraged. But um, so I think it's just the kind of the, the basically the editing piece of it and the ability to make quick changes and easy changes um, that that make it a sort of downside. Now, in terms of bringing your sort of hand drawn stuff into digital software, you know, it really depends on the context. So that's not an easy thing to answer in a, um, a sort of you know black or white way, I should say. <laughs> um, but uh, I think it's you know, I would say just to. Uh, you know, a lot of what we've been talking about today, everybody's presentations is about perception, 
right? So it's about, you know, we, you know, Sven was talking about, you know, perception in terms of pattern and um, shapes and things, you know, sort of how numbers become patterns and shapes and that sort of thing. And then Fabio was talking about how we perceive color and perception. And I think the same can be said for, um, you know, using you know, sort of, you know, drawing in pictorial styles, right? So the, the most important thing is you want to be, you want to communicate. So you want your, let's say, neuron to look like a neuron. And if you're hand drawing it, you know, some people will have better success at that than others, right? <laughs> Whereas if it's in digital software, I think it's easier to achieve. So um, it's, it's really about making sure that people are able to decode what you've encoded in the, the, these sort of visuals. Thank you. Right. And and of course, um, among, I, I imagine, I, I know that nature does, and I'm sure other places, you know, use maybe those uh, beginning figures as inspiration in papers to, to hand to designers to, to kind of redraw and recreate um, that work, right? That's correct, yes. Yep. Thank you. Um, we have lots of other questions. I mean, uh, if I move on to you, Sven, I mean, we've had loads of questions about um, careers, I suppose, is working in this sort of world of scientific illustration and design. Um, I know that you hold a PhD, and I wondered if you could talk maybe a little bit, uh, give some career advice to anyone hoping to go into this sort of world if that's something you're comfortable doing i'm not sure i i, I, <laughs> I can do that like i don't know i the the way i see it is you you find something you care about you're passionate about you keep doing it and and the path will emerge right so i i, I don't i didn't get to what i'm doing now by deciding i don't know 10 15 years ago this is where i'm going to end up right every time you have a couple options, right? And you look at what interests you more and maybe also what maybe makes more sense. That's a more viable path to go down. And then you you, you pursue that, right? And you pursue it with a lot of energy and interest and right, you, you want to make sure that it's something you really care about. And then you learn a lot, right? And you get better at it. And I think I, I'm a firm believer in you. You make your own kind of luck a bit. So it, it'll that's how, how it happens. So I don't think... I planned where I got to in that way, right? Like when I started my PhD, I thought, right, academia is a great place to be. And then maybe at some point you realize, <laughs> maybe that is not my path. And then another one opens up, right? But it's not, you don't immediately go, oh, yeah, this is the alternative. This is what I'm going to do, right? You probe and you figure it out. And I don't know whether that's a satisfying answer, but. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I, I... I found myself nodding along with that. I'm, I totally agree mm -hmm. with you. Like, there's a lot of um, hindsight and bias, I think, when people look back on their careers and then yeah. suggest all the things that they learned yeah. along the way, and then um, uh, yeah, and present it as kind of advice for people in the future, which isn't necessarily how it always works. Um, so, thank you. No, I think that's an honest and really fair answer. Um, Kelly and Fabio, I'm, I'm not sure if you have anything to add specifically to kind of um, careers in design. Um, Kelly, I know you recruit. Um, designers, I'm not sure if you might look for anything particular or anything else you'd add. Uh, right. So, you know, we look for, um, you know, in the context of science <clears throat> communication, it, you know, it's good to have a sort of overlap of, um, you know, science literacy, but you don't necessarily need to have a sort of PhD or, or ha you know, have been in the lab. Um, but, you know, the most important thing is training in visual communication. And there are a lot of different kinds of um, <clears throat> art careers that we have. So we have, uh, you know, we have a team of the visuals team, which they, you know, they specialize in um, photography and video and images. And then we have others who are specifically scientific illustrators. We have uh, others who are information designers and um, data visualizer, data visualizers, more more like along the lines of Sven. Um, and uh, <clears throat> excuse me. So I'd say, you know, um, sorry, I'm just going to take a sip of water. No problem. Um, <clears throat> so um, I think it, you know, how how I, I, you know, I didn't enter, you know, the world thinking that I wanted to be a creative director or work in design, but, you know, I was um, in a slightly different field where I just found myself enjoying design and the parts of my day that, that were design and I just kind of followed that instinct. Um, so, you know, I think, I think like Sven says, it's just, you know, sort of following the instincts of the things that you're compelled to do and enjoy. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, that completely makes sense to me. Uh, Fabi, I'm not sure you have anything to add. I mean, you don't have to add anything <laughs> if you don't. Uh, I've got another question for you. Um, um, I have like, maybe a short answer to that. Sure. Um, just from a, a slightly different angle. 
So um, I consider all scientists actually also a bit of graphic designer because we all use the methodology, right? Um, we haven't received education, most of us, but um, I would just recommend everyone to, to put in the same effort as they would do with other methods like statistics, um, tools or approach, graphic design in the same way, and just, you know, do the key things right. And then um, in most cases, you're safe already. Thank you. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. I'm going to um, stick with you, Fabi, on that because I've got a kind of follow up question, which I think is relevant um, and which is around um, using posters, um, like creating posters for uh, to present your research at conferences and things like that. Um, someone's asked uh, how to choose sort of appropriate color to make make posters accessible and sensible for people. Um, but I'm going to maybe add to that and ask you to just share some other advice for making great posters for conferences in a minute or so thank you okay um uh, yeah that's a really good question um the main aspect of, of, of a poster is to just effectively uh, transfer the knowledge or your research insights to other people and for this um there has been a really nice resource open access resource to open the better posters uh, as they are called. Um, for example, on sync.org, the web page I mentioned during my talk, uh, you find um, um, uh, the basis for these posters, and then you just fill in all the details, the figures and the text and so on. And they are, are intentionally made for just effectively um, communicate um, science. So yeah, and then in terms of colors, it doesn't really matter what colors you use, but um, just don't overdo it and, and use colors you like, I guess. Also. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, OK, we're, we're almost out of time, but I think we've got time for one more really quick question. Um, veterans of these webcast program will know I like to end on kind of a, a happy note, but I'm going to change it a little bit this time around and ask for your pet visual hates because I just wondered if maybe oh, yeah. that was an interesting thing to uh, <laughs> to ask. So. Kelly, if you don't mind me starting with you, is there, is there one thing in particular that you would delete forever, steer people away from, never do again, never want to see ever oh. again? Hmm. Okay, I guess um, this is a good one. I think uh, you know we get a lot of um, submissions for covers that sort of use metaphors that are a bit sort of overused. Um, so like cliches, I guess. So again, I'll go back to writing. It's a bit like, you know, so just avoid sort of visual cliches. And then there's a bit of a fine line there because you're looking for a visual metaphor that people recognize. But like, for example, um, you know, we'll get something in the shape of a question mark, you know, and it's sort of, and I've, I've said this before, you know, but it's sort of like all science can be boiled down to a question mark, right? So it's sort of not really giving you anything, you know, um, you know, we can do a bit better than that or, or things I can, um, yeah, so I, I would say avoid sort of visual cliches and things that are just kind of noise. Um, and I also say, you know, it's better not to have an image than a really bad image, particularly if you're sharing something on social media or whatever. <laughs> because, yeah, um, yeah, so that's what, yeah, I hope that's. Thank you. No, no, that's that's an excellent um, visual pet hate. I like it. Okay. Um, Sven, do you have anything, uh, any particular pet hates you'd you'd point well, people towards hate is I hate is strong and um, <laughs> but I, I guess like I don't like clutter so visual clutter and so I think it's especially what you find is often when when you're not familiar with good design practice right there's this tendency to fill up the space right and put in as much as you can oh here's a bit of room let's do a bit more or we could make this a look a bit prettier we add a bit more detail to it right but that's what I was referring to earlier the talk about that's noise right what you want to think about is what is the key message what i'm creating is communicating and probably pretty much everything else is superfluous and can be removed right and so the the more white space you have and that might not be literal white space right you can see that as a metaphor in itself uh it helps the message itself stand out right and it could like kelly was saying maybe that isn't even a visual maybe it's a, couple, a sentence right that but the way you present it, it becomes visual, right? And it becomes obvious. Um, it, it relates back to the, the poster question even, right? Maybe the way to make your poster stand out is to think about what all the other posters look like, 
and make sure yours doesn't look the same, right? Yours is different in a way um, to get the attention as people walk past. So yeah, um, I guess visual clutter would be probably the one I'd pick. Um, Thank you. That's a great uh, answer. Yeah, I um, I found my again. I found myself sort of nodding along yeah. as you were talking. Um, Fabio, any any last kind of uh, visual hates to to close this webcast on? Yeah, I think for me it's quite clear. Um, I really like rainbow in the sky and <laughs> on the legs, but but I don't think it has any room anymore in data visualization and scientific papers. So that would be my choice, I guess. <laughs> Thank you. Excellent. Yeah. Um, really on brand. And I, I, um, I, I, now I've seen your webcast, I entirely agree. Um, but, and I hope, I'm sure everyone else does as well. Um, thank you everyone for attending. Thanks so much to our speakers for joining this webcast. Um, we're going to close out now, but uh, thank you for all of your questions and I hope this has been helpful. Uh, and we we'll look forward to seeing you again very soon. Thank you.